I want to thank you all for being here this evening. I'm Anthony Crowell, the Dean and President here at New York Law School. And we have a wonderful event celebrating the appointment of Professor David Chang as the Theodore Dwight 125th Anniversary Professor of Law. And we will listen to his terrific lecture on debate, deception, and the character of our communities, reflections on our nation's political discourse illuminated by our law school's founding. Now, could there be any more fitting a topic during this season of high national political drama? And of course, the law school's Quasqua Centennial Anniversary. Um, this investiture kicks off our 2016 alumni reunion, and it is a truly special occasion. We are celebrating New York Law School's 125th anniversary this year, and we have the honor of recognizing David Chang and his extraordinary scholarship and leadership as a teacher, colleague, and principal advocate for our students by bestowing a professorship named after our law school's founder, Theodore Dwight. So before we start, let me recognize David's brother, Joseph, who's here tonight. His brother and other family members must be incredibly proud to see his life's work recognized with one of the highest honors a faculty member can receive. And we all look forward to many more years of the extraordinary work and contributions that David will make on behalf of our community. So although Theodore Dwight is best known to us as the revolutionary who founded New York Law School, throughout his entire career, he also was an innovator who developed new law schools and programs at every step. At Hamilton College, from which Dwight received his undergraduate degree, he became the Maynard Professor of Law, History, Civil Polity, and Political Economy. During his time at, ha at Hamilton, in just his early 30s, he led the creation of their then law school and headed law programs there. He eventually headed downstate to Columbia, where he founded their law school and became its first dean. His, last, uh, his tenure lasted more than three decades, and during this time, he became a leading advocate for a new method of instruction at Columbia. <clears throat> Theodore Dwight wanted to make the practice of law more accessible to a wider pool of potential students, and became a fierce proponent of his new teaching method. When Columbia pushed back on Dwight's methods, he decided, along with a group of like-minded faculty members, alumni, and students, that it was time for a new, independent legal institution where he could shape instruction without interference from outside stakeholders. That institution became New York Law School, which proudly opened its doors in 1891. Although Theodore Dwight passed away only a year later, his fierce independence, dedication to the law, and desire to develop new ways to bring legal education to as broad a group as possible has been a central part of our character since that time. New York Law School was one of the first to open its doors to immigrants, to women and minorities, and as a result, many of our alumni were firsts in their field. It also can be seen in the fact that NYLS was one of the first law schools in the nation to offer a part-time evening program to those who had job or family commitments that prevented them from enrolling full-time. This has allowed us to be a go-to law school for police officers, firefighters, veterans, and mid-career professionals. And today, we continue to be a leader amongst our peer institutions, maintaining our commitment to being an extremely inclusive school, providing opportunities for many students to receive legal education that they might otherwise not have had. And one of our most prominent faculty leaders committed to these values every day, and someone who fully embodies the innovative and unique qualities New York Law School is known for is David Chang. And like Theodore Dwight, David Chang is an institution builder, devoting his entire legal career to building New York Law School and championing its students. He's also an institution himself, and someone who, from the beginning of my service as dean, I have relied upon for guidance, counsel, and mentorship. He's a wonderful friend. Not only has David served on the faculty here for 33 years, nearly a quarter of the law school's existence, but his New York Law School roots go all the way back to 1956, when his maternal grandfather, Maurice Joseph, graduated from the evening division and received the Ellsberg Prize for proficiency in the law of contracts, which we still award at our commencements annually. Maurice was a mid-career professional who worked for New York State as an auditor during his time at NYLS. 
that Maurice's grandson would become such a prominent figure here at the law school is a tremendous legacy. And no doubt, David's formidable connection to the school has provided a working environment which holds deep personal meaning to him on many levels. David's entire career and scholarship has been devoted to the idea of the law as a mechanism to expand rights, that the law is there to protect the defenseless. Indeed, his career is remarkable and a testament to the devotion David has to teaching new generations of lawyers at NYLS and instilling in them the same passion he has for how the law is the vehicle for delivering justice and fairness. David earned his BA magna cum laude from Haverford College in 1979 and a JD from Yale Law School in 1982. He began his legal career as a law clerk to Judge W. Arthur Garrity of the U.S. District Court of Massachusetts at a time when the judge began a transition from close judicial supervision of the Boston School Committee's compliance with the court's orders desegregating Boston's public schools to such supervision by the Massachusetts Board of Education. Following his tenure with the judge, he joined New York Law School, where he has been a leader amongst the faculty and a mentor to many students, including the Black Law Students Association. He's received several awards for his scholarship during his time here, including the Walter M. Jeffords Distinguished Writing Award, and he won the Otto L. Walter Distinguished Writing Award, not once, not twice, but three times. His scholarship has truly blazed a trail with such thought-provoking articles as Beyond Uncompromising Positions, Hate Crimes Legislation and the Common Ground Between Conservative Republicans and Gay Rights Advocates, and also Discriminatory Impact, Affirmative Action and Innocent Victims, Judicial Conservatism, or Conservative Justices, which won him the Jeffords Award. And in the most prominent example of the esteem our students have held for David, most recently he received the Class of 2014's Teaching Award at commencement from that year's graduating class. David's passion and commitment for redressing wrongs and combating hate and violence led him to serve as co-chair of the New York City Gay and Lesbian Anti-Violence Project. As a leader of the project, he was a tireless fighter against some of the city's most heinous incidents of brutality, and he pushed for legislative remedies through the passage of anti-hate crime statutes. His conscience and belief in the power of the law stands as an indispensable example for all of our students to follow. And as Dean, I can say that it is also true when it comes to his impact on our faculty. He's chaired the Academic Support Curriculum Committee, <clears throat> leading the effort to develop and implement the law school's successful comprehensive curriculum program, which has served as a blueprint for curricular enhancements underway today. When David Chang speaks, people listen because he always has something meaningful to say. And he always speaks in the interest of what's best for our students. Of the many things that can be said about David, perhaps this is the most important. That's because he approaches his work with incredible seriousness, incredible thought, sincerity of purpose, and as a result, his voice and ideas command the kind of respect that everyone should wish be accorded to their own. Faculties are dynamic organizations. They like to operate by building consensus or at least great support. And it's always gratifying to receive David Chang's support because his thoughtfulness and innovative approaches on all things pedagogy are terrific. They're always well-reasoned, and his colleagues know they can be confident that David's viewpoints are ones that look out comprehensively and exclusively for the student's interest. After NYLS was founded, in his final year before passing away, Theodore Dwight was on the masthead of the first law review produced by the law school and wrote an article titled, what shall we do when we leave law school? In this piece, he described how new law graduates should continue to develop their expertise and what he felt were the qualities needed for them to be effective lawyers. He felt it was most important to have good character and even more so than a, some sort of a sense of innate ability. And it was important to be true to oneself. And I note that this is a key theme in David's lecture tonight. Theodore Dwight eloquently wrote, and I quote, we must all, if unprejudiced, admit that self-culture of the highest type is the best form of success. Houses, fields, money, even the respect and esteem of others are but the surroundings of a man and may depend upon opportunity or accident. In the final analysis, one must agree with Horace 
that the highest and truest form of man is he who can enwrap himself in his own virtues as in a garment. Then, whether the accessories of life attend him bountifully or sparingly, we can answer to the inquiry, was he successful? With an unhesitating and emphatic affirmative. So looking at David's wonderful career and considering he does everything with the highest character and virtue, we can all safely say without hesitation and with emphatic affirmation that David has been successful throughout his entire life, that he will continue to be one of our most valued and most impactful colleagues. And tonight, with his timely lecture, we will be the beneficiaries of his unique insights. It's now my pleasure to ask Professor Kirk Burkhalter, a valued, a valued faculty member at NYLS and an alumnus, to speak more about David's impact in the classroom. Kirk. Good evening. So it is, uh, it is my honor to introduce David uh, Chang this evening. And uh, I was really uh, shocked and floored and humbled whenever David asked if I would introduce him. Um, I believe uh, firmly that my perspective of David is unique amongst all my colleagues. So David is my colleague here on the faculty. Uh, he's been a mentor throughout my career, and I was his former student. So I think that would qualify as, uh, as being quite unique. Um, so I'd just like to talk a little bit about those various aspects. And um, I'm actually having flashbacks. My classmate uh, is sitting next to me. I just asked her, do you think David will call on us later? And if he does, I'm going to pass. <laughs> so um, you know, as a student, um, David was the first professor that I met at New York Law School. I met him uh, just prior to law school starting. I went to an event uh, given by the Black Law Students Association. And at the end of the event, David introduced himself to the group and said, if you ever have any questions, feel free to ask me. And I saw him in the hallway. I didn't know we had assignments that were posted somewhere. I wouldn't know where to find him. And I stopped him. I said, hey, there's the professor that said, ask him any questions. So I asked him. They gave me that patented David Chang look like, oh my goodness, here's another one who won't follow instructions. <laughs> However, he told me exactly uh, where, to, where to find what I was looking for. And he's always been uh, that type of person uh, that I could ask questions of. Uh, David was also the uh, author of the first um, law review article I ever read. And uh, Villanova Journal of Law, Critique on Judicial Supremacy, and I read it because in his syllabus, there was a tiny little footnote that said, if you get a chance, read my law review article. And of course, a lot of folks didn't want to read it because it was about 110 pages. And I bothered to read it. And it really helped me digest and understand uh, what we were learning in class. Uh, David Chang's Constitutional Law 1 and 2 course uh, for many years was an institution here at New York Law School. When I entered this school as a first year student, I remember a student approaching me and I said, hi, how are you? They said, oh, are you in the day or evening? And I said, I'm in the evening division. They said, you know, next year you have Cheng. So <laughs> this is what, it was, it was a rite of passage uh, in the evening division to spend a full year with David and rightly so, and rightly so. Uh, as a student, as, as David's student, I learned um, many, a great deal of many lessons. One being uh, an adherence to the rule of law and being able to articulate the rule of law precisely and with clarity and accurately. Uh, further, we learned in his class the origins of constitutional law. We learned the development of constitutional law. We learned to challenge what we read. And for me, uh, one of the most important things, was we learned the standards of this profession. Uh, being attention to detail, responsibility, character, and understanding what our clients would expect of us. Uh, David was quite the taskmaster in class, and rightly so. That's what we all came to law school for, uh, to be the best. And we all always felt we were better for, uh, for taking con law with David Chang. Uh, as a colleague, David has served as a mentor. He was a mentor in, uh, in law school. I started teaching because David 
uh, was the supervisor of the teaching fellows when I was a student, and he mentored me, and that was really my first foray into, into teaching. And as a colleague now, as a member of the faculty with David, uh, the one thing I've learned is the adherence to one's principles. Uh, David has instilled in me that the primary mission of us in the legal academy is to ensure that students are prepared for this profession. And that mission has to be unwavering. So that sounds rather simple, but quite often, if you adhere to that mission, that may lead you to choose to do something that may not be popular with students or your colleagues, but so be it because it's on mission. And David is of singular focus and singular purpose. Uh, everything is about the students and about the institution. Every decision is about the students and the institution. And I don't know if I've ever heard David talk about the effect of any decision he has ever made on his career. I don't know if I've ever heard the words career come out of David's mouth. However, I do hear the words New York Law School and students come out of David's mouth every day and what we're doing and why we should do it. So as a mentor, being a faculty member, that's what I've learned from David, to do the right thing uh, for our institution and our students, even if it's not necessarily the most popular thing, uh, even if our students feel that you're riding them a little bit, at the end of the day, like me, they'll know years from now that they were better for it. I think that it's very fitting that David receives uh, this endowment because uh, if you think about the origins of New York Law School, this steadfast commitment to purpose and the mission that would cause faculty members to leave another institution and come downtown and start their own law school, well, that speaks of David's commitment to what he believes the legal, legal academy should be. So I could go on uh, forever, but you're here to hear David this evening. And once again, uh, he's been a tremendous friend, uh, mentor, far better golf player than I will ever be, which he has told me. <laughs> um, but uh, it's just my honor. So I will, uh, without further ado, introduce uh, David Chang. Thank you, uh, thank you so much. I, I must say this is uh, all quite overwhelming. I did not expect so many people and uh, so many um, valued colleagues, current students, former students, um, colleagues in the administration. Uh, so this is all very gratifying. Let me um, begin by thanking Dean Crowell for your very uh, kind introduction. And I want to thank you for your strong leadership over the past five years, uh, your accomplishments for our community and with our community have been truly inspiring. And I do sincerely appreciate your presence uh, at this time, uh, at this um, very personally difficult time. Uh, you've always been there for all of us in so many ways. And I want you to know that all of us feel for you and all of us are here for you. Um, I want to thank Kirk Burkhalter for uh, his kind uh, introduction as well. Um, Kirk is now a colleague and a friend, and um, I barely remember, remember his days as a student, but um, he tells me about them uh, once in a while. <laughs> um, as a New York a Law School graduate, Kirk um, really represents our best he personifies our mission of enabling people to enter the legal profession through untraditional routes and then to excel. And Kirk did take an untraditional route to law school, pretty traditional in law school, and since graduation he has excelled. Um, as uh, Anthony said, my grandfather, uh, his name was Maurice Joseph, and he was one of New York Law School's untraditional students and graduates. Uh, more than 60 years ago. And um, our school's mission has been important to my family um, well before I started teaching here, and in fact, 
before I was born. Not that long before I was born, but before I was born. And I am glad that my brother Joseph Chang is here and he teaches uh, statistics at Yale. Um, very glad to see um, Ed Purcell, who is everyone's scholarly role model and, and mentor. Uh, Steve Elliman, who exemplifies subtlety and decency. <laughs> Bill Lapiana, doing heroic work now as Associate Dean. And um, so many others who I wish I could specifically mention tonight. Uh, but my talk is um, almost an hour long. And um, I'd like us all to have a chance to party afterwards. <laughs> so um, this appointment and this celebration today are, uh, are so gratifying to me. Uh, to be appointed as the first holder of a chair named for our spiritual founder, uh, commemorating our 125th anniversary at the beginning of Alumni Weekend leaves me feeling humbled and um, maybe a little proud. I've spent almost my entire professional life here. For more than 30 years, I've had the privilege of teaching thousands of our students and learning from them as well. And um, I'm glad to see so many of my former students here uh, it's very gratifying. I thank you for coming, and I look forward to speaking with you later tonight. I've had the great fortune to work with dedicated and talented faculty colleagues and equally impressive members of the administration. I've had such abiding professional satisfaction from being part of this law school because this is more than a place where people learn and teach and administer. It's a place where there is a true spirit of community. We are a community of earnest strivers, people striving to better themselves and others through learning, thinking, teaching, writing, and participating. And through all of this, people striving to enhance the broader community. This chair is named for Theodore Dwight, who was a cornerstone of our New York Law School tradition of earnest striving and contribution to the community. Dwight was such a major figure, not only in our founding, but in all of early modern legal education. In 1858, as the dean noted, uh, Dwight was instrumental in founding Columbia Law School. For decades, he shaped how law was taught, not only at Columbia, but also at other schools. Dwight believed that law is best taught by having students read treatises discussing legal principles stated by legal scholars. He believed that students should be assigned to read cases, but only to illustrate those pre-digested and crystallized legal principles in operation. In ensuing decades, an alternative educational approach gained favor, significantly through the efforts of Christopher Langdale at Harvard Law School. Langdale believed that law is best taught by having students read cases. Students should be led by their professors to extract legal principles from the cases through their own efforts. As is well known, in 1891, authorities at uh, Dwight's Columbia Law School decided to follow Harvard's lead by abandoning Dwight's method of teaching through treatises and adopting Langdale's method of teaching through cases. Dwight then decided to retire from Columbia, and most of Dwight's teaching colleagues retired, I should say resigned, with him and immediately established a new law school, our New York Law School, to teach by Dwight's method. One of those former Columbia law professors was George Chase, who became our first dean. 125 years later, here we all are, beneficiaries of Dwight's and Chase's legacy. In 1891, the dispute between the reformers at Columbia Law School and the conservatives who created New York Law School was high stakes. It had not only pedagogic dimensions, but also political and economic implications as well. And naturally, people beyond Columbia and New York Law School were debating and taking sides. For example, in October of 1891, just after New York Law School began operations, the student editors of the Harvard Law Review concluded that Columbia's rejection of Dwight's methods and adoption of Langdale's confirmed Harvard's supremacy. 
they published an article criticizing New York Law School as inferior and its founders as backwards. These Harvard students claimed that New York Law School's mission was merely to provide a practical legal education simply so that graduates could pass the bar exam. They said that New York Law School's curriculum disregarded critically important intellectual matters such as the theory, history, and science of the law. Our Dean Chase was quite upset about mistakes in the Harvard Law Review description of his new school. And I'll get back to what happened next in just a minute. But who was right in this dispute about pedagogy and in this rivalry among law schools is not my focus. Instead, I'd like to focus on how people engage in debate when they disagree about matters of policy. In particular, I'd like to examine the importance of truthfulness when people express themselves in public debate and the harms that can result when people intentionally mis misrepresent what they truly think and the ways in which different communities with different ethics of truthfulness do and can respond to deceitful thinking and its resulting harms. Now, it was members of an academic community who debated law school pedagogy in, in 1891. Certain aspects of that debate can remind us of what is special about an academic community and can provide a frame of reference for thinking about truthfulness and deceitfulness in our national political community. So let's return to the story about Dean Chase's dispute with those Harvard Law Review students. Once those Harvard students published their criticisms of New York Law School, Dean Chase contacted them and he asked them to publish his response. If only he said, as a matter of common fairness. The Harvard students refused. Dean Chase then was able to publish an open letter to those Harvard students in the American Law Review. In that letter, he chastised the Harvard Law Review not only for the mistakes they did publish, but also for their stubborn refusal to publish his response. Chase further addressed those Harvard students, maybe more with irony than charity, by saying, I still venture to believe that it is not in your purpose to do us knowingly an injustice. Dwight, sorry, Chase contrasted them with others who he called the true exponents of the Harvard method. He said, I feel assured that the true exponents are lovers of truth and fairness, honest seekers after facts, who when facts are known will give them their true weight. In chastising those Harvard students, Dean Chase was asserting the value of sincerity and the wrongfulness of deceitfulness when people debate. He distinguished between strategically communicating error as a lover of winning with inadvertently communicating error as a lover of truth. It's one thing to be wrong if wrong in good faith, but it's quite something else and quite something bad to communicate a message one does not believe to be true while trying to persuade others to accept it as true. Theodore Dwight and George Chase had their convictions. They expressed them honestly, with no agenda of manipulating or patting the deck with anything other than their true ideas. They had the character to debate with, with sincerity. In this, Dwight and Chase were not so different from so many in legal education and in education more broadly, not only 125 years ago, but today as well. As members of an academic community, part of our identity involves truthfully communicating the truth as we see it. And in an academic community, as George Chase tried with those Harvard Law students, just a gentle reminder about the ethic of truthfulness in discourse can be sufficient, though not always, to bring back on track those who might have strayed. Now, what about our national political discourse today? We seem to tolerate and even to expect that politicians and activists will say anything to influence public opinion, even when they don't believe in the truth of their intended message. For example, a political organization engages in push polling in South Carolina with the intent to manipulate racist voters into believing that John McCain fathered a mixed race child with a woman who was not his wife Yet these push pollsters might not themselves actually believe that their intended message is true. A presidential candidate makes claims that he had seen television reports of thousands of Muslims in Jersey City celebrating the attacks of 9-11. Then in the face of evidence to the contrary, he doubles down insistently. 
His initial claim might have been a negligent yet honest mistake. But in his ongoing and repeated insistence, he may be communicating a message he does not believe to be true, while intending to persuade the public that it is true. A presidential candidate claims to oppose marriage equality on personal religious grounds, when perhaps he does believe in marriage equality and is refraining from stating his true views for reasons of political calculation. These are examples of people who speak with an intent very different from Dean Chase's lover of truth and fairness and honest seekers after facts. Dean Chase was describing people truthfully expressing their true beliefs. The political speakers in the scenarios I've just outlined speak with an intent to deceive the public about their true beliefs. Now, obviously, communicating to achieve some victory by asserting arguments what one does not believe to be true is inconsistent with the character of an academic community and harms its essential truth-seeking mission. Does deceitful political speech harm our national political community? And if it does, can and should we do anything about it? And just to be clear for reasons I'll discuss later, I'm not defining deceitful political speech as the communication of a false statement with knowledge of such falsity. Instead, by deceitful political speech, I mean the following. The communication of a message, the intended meaning of which the speaker did not believe to be true, but which the speaker intended to persuade the public to accept as true. So let me frame three questions I'd like to address about deceitful political speech. First, in what ways is deceitful political speech harmful to our national political community? Second, must we continue to tolerate so much deceitful speaking in our nation's political discourse? Or might we think about using law to create incentives so that political speakers are less likely to communicate deceitfully and more likely to speak truthfully? Third, if we were to think about shaping disincentives through law against deceitful political speaking, what specific constitutional barriers would these regulatory efforts face? And do these constitutional doctrines make sense for protecting our freedom of speech today? So question one, what harms does deceitful political speech inflict on our national political community? Here's the first harm. Deceitful political speech inflicts speech opportunity costs. The opportunity costs involve the creation and discussion of false disagreements that ought to be debated less and the masking of real disagreements that need to be debated more. To elaborate, if the deceitful speaker's opponents respond, they will have debated an issue that need not have been because there was no true disagreement between them about that particular deceitful assertion. But if the opponents do not respond, the deceitful speaker's lie goes unchallenged. Furthermore, real disagreements that do need to be discussed are obscured. Because the deceitful speaker has failed to communicate his actual views, the real disagreement between him and his opponents remains hidden, and the public is robbed of debate about the true views and motives of the opposing parties. Furthermore, by responding to a speaker's deceitful message, his opponents will have been denied opportunities to communicate their own views according to their own priorities because they have limited time and resources. Here's an example. During the, their debate preceding the Michigan primary, Hillary Clinton charged that Bernie Sanders was, quote, against the auto bailout, unquote. She based that claim on Sanders' vote against the TARP legislation in early 2009. We all recognize the familiar strategy of distorting the meaning of an opponent's legislative vote. This strategy either can succeed in misleading the public if there is no response, or creates false issues that need not have been debated if there is a response. Here Sanders did respond, both at the debate and in television ads. If Clinton did not actually believe that Sanders was against the auto bailout, Clinton could have criticized Right, sorry, sorry. Her assertion involved deceit, deceitful political speech and created a false issue that did not need to be debated, but was. Furthermore, rather than misrepresenting Sanders' position on the auto bailout, Clinton could have criticized his vote against TARP for placing more weight on opposing Wall Street than on supporting Detroit. 
she could have crystallized their true disagreement over priorities, and this true disagreement could have been debated. But her distortion of Sanders' position, if intentional misrepresentation, was deceitful speech obscuring the true disagreement that could have been debated, but was not. Here's the second harm. Deceitful political speech can result in political decision costs. By this I mean electoral or policy decisions actually made that might not have been, and decisions not made that might have been, had the deceitful speaker communicated more truthfully. In other contexts, when people make harmful choices because of intentionally falsified premises, we understand that they have been victims of fraud and have suffered injury subject to redress from those who committed the fraud. When a citizen votes relying on the fraudulent representations of a candidate or an activist, that citizen has suffered cognizable harm. If an election's outcome is the result of fraudulent representations by a candidate or an activist group or a corporation, the defrauded public have suffered cognizable injury. And here's the third harm. Deceitful political speech can result in speech devaluation costs. If deceitful speech is pervasive and expected, it could degrade the bonds necessary to tie people together as a community capable of engaging in meaningful discourse. If voters think that any political statement could be a lie, they could tend to tune out all political discourse or at least speech by those with whom they disagree. Indeed, in a culture that expects deceitful political speech, the value of truthful speaking is debased and the freedom of speech itself is trivialized. Furthermore, the risk of these harms increases as the quantity of deceitful political speech increases. Citizens United is troubling enough because it created corporate rights to use accumulated wealth potentially to dominate political discourse. But its implications are far worse when we recognize that a wealthy corporation or a wealthy individual or PAC for that matter could manipulatively dominate discourse with deceitful speech. So consider this as an example. There's evidence, now the subject of securities fraud investigations in New York and California, that since the 1980s, corporate managers at ExxonMobil may have actually believed that burning fossil fuels is causing climate change. At the same time, they contested that very proposition by spending over $30 million on political speech between 1998 and 2014. Presumably, they recognized that expressing their true reasons for opposing carbon regulation or subsidies for other energy sources would be politically unpersuasive. ExxonMobil denies that it misrepresented management's views. But if these managers truly did believe, since the 1980s, that burning fossil fuels is causing climate change, their massively funded messages to the contrary involved deceitful political speech that distorted public debate for decades. In particular, if ExxonMobil's speech was deceitful, the public has suffered speech opportunity costs. We've had to engage in more debate about issues that in truth were less contested, whether climate change is occurring and whether it's caused by burning fossil fuels. And we've debated questions less that should have been debated more, questions about priorities, such as whether the short-term benefits of higher profits for corporations and lower energy costs for consumers are worth the long-term damage to the planet and what should be done about climate change, and when. And the electorate may have suffered political decision costs, making choices it would not have, and failing to make choices it might have if ExxonMobil, and probably others, had not engaged in their deceitful advocacy. Beyond this, these harms were all the greater because ExxonMobil was able to fund such a great amount of deceitful speech with its, with its accumulated corporate wealth. In an academic community, Deceitful communication is chilled by its members' expectations, which are forged by a sense of professional role and an ingrained sense of professional ethics. With this, the character of an academic community and the character of its discourse are maintained by each member's self-restraint and self-regulation and internalized commitment to discussing truthfully that which each believes to be true. But in our broader political community, Self-restraint and self-regulation seem all too exceptional. In political debate, truthfully communicating one's true views too often is sacrificed to a goal of winning the interest battle of the moment. 
So let me turn to my second main question. In our broader community, must we tolerate debate filled with deceitful speaking and its resulting harms? Or might we at least think about using law to shape incentives so that political actors are less likely to speak so deceitfully and more likely to speak more truthfully? Well, some states have enacted so-called political false statement laws. For example, Ohio enacted a statute criminalizing the communication of a false statement concerning the voting record of a candidate when done with knowledge or reckless disregard of such falsity. This statute was struck down by the Sixth Circuit just two months ago. Minnesota enacted a statute criminalizing the dissemination of a false statement about the effect of a ballot initiative when done with knowledge or re reckless disregard of such falsity. This statute was invalidated by the Eighth Circuit about two years ago. Fewer than 20 states have enacted a political false statement law. Furthermore, statutes like Ohio's and Minnesota's address only a subset of the problem I've identified as deceitful political speech. They would not address, for example, the decades-long mass dissemination of messages about climate change by the managers at ExxonMobil, even if those managers were intentionally misrepresenting their views. They would not address the mass dissemination of videos edited to, edited to convey the message that Planned Parenthood was selling parts of aborted fetuses for profit, even if the disseminators did this editing with the intent to distort the meaning of those recorded conversations and to deceive the public about what the participants actually said. Why haven't more states enacted political false statement laws? And why do those laws which have been enacted address only knowingly false statements of fact about candidates or about ballot initiatives, rather than deceitful political speech more broadly? Well, the reasons, or at least some of them, are rooted in cultural and doctrinal presuppositions about speech and are illustrated by a 2012 Supreme Court decision in a case called United States versus Alvarez which invalidated a federal statute called the Defense of Valor Act. Both the Sixth Circuit and the Eighth Circuit relied in part on Alvarez in striking down Ohio's and Minnesota's political false statement laws. This Defense of Valor Act made it a crime for a person to communicate a false claim that he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor when done with knowledge of such falsity. In Alvarez, the statute was applied to a local official who made his claim during a public hearing. Based on proof that he lied about receiving the medal, Alvarez was convicted. He challenged the conviction as violating the First Amendment. Explaining the decision to invalidate this statute, Justice Kennedy, for a plurality of four, said the following. The remedy for speech that is false is speech that is true. This is the ordinary course in a free society. The response to the unreasoned is the rational, to the uninformed, the enlightened. The response to the straight out lie is the simple truth. This passage rests on a basic principle at the background of our political culture and of much First Amendment doctrine. Against the regulation of speech, and especially political speech, there is a strong presumption of constitutionally mandated laissez-faire. The default remedy for speech that causes harm is not government intervention, but responsive speech. Elaborating on this posture of laissez-faire for the marketplace of ideas, the Supreme Court has insisted that political debate should be, quote, uninhibited, robust, and wide open, close quote. Now, surely counter speech is the proper remedy for harms inflicted by speech one might view as wrong or offensive when that speech does express the true views of the speaker. So members of the Klan or communists or flag burners truthfully expressing their true opinions are not subject to regulation, but only to being contested and defeated in the marketplace of ideas. But I question the extent to which counter speech truly is a sound cure for harms inflicted by deceitful political speech. And here's why. Counter speech involves engaging with an assertion which the deceitful speaker himself did not believe to be true. Rather than a cure for the harms caused by deceitful political speech, counter speech is itself part of those harms. Most importantly, speech opportunity costs, 
involving the creation and discussion of false disagreements that ought to be debated less and the masking of real disagreements that need to be debated more. Furthermore, counter speech as the supposed cure ignores the additional derivative harms, the distorted political outcomes, and the general trivializing of political speaking that can result when political actors routinely communicate deceitfully. So now for my third main question. If we were to think about shaping disincentives through law against deceitful political speaking, what specific constitutional barriers would these regulatory efforts face? And do those constitutional barriers make sense for protecting our freedom of speech today? So let me begin by quickly sketching some basic doctrine. Under the First Amendment, of course, most speech is viewed as constitutionally valuable and therefore protected for its own sake. There are a few categories of speech that the Supreme Court has deemed to be constitutionally valueless and not protected for their own sake. These categories of unprotected speech have included defamation, obscenity, child pornography, and fighting words. A law that regulates protected speech based on its content is presumed unconstitutional and subject to so-called strict scrutiny, which leads to almost certain invalidation. <coughs> Furthermore, a regulatory purpose of deterring the expression of protected speech generally is constitutionally impermissible per se. But if a law regulates a category of speech that has been deemed constitutionally valueless and not protected for its own sake, strict scrutiny with its near certain invalidation does not necessarily apply. Furthermore, a regulatory purpose of deterring the expression of such valueless speech can be constitutionally permissible. So whether strict scrutiny necessarily applies to regulations of deceitful political speech, and whether a regulatory purpose of deterring such deceitfulness is impermissible per se, or possibly permissible, depends on whether deceitful political speech qualifies as constitutionally valuable and fully protected, or instead as a category of speech that is valueless and not protected for its own sake. The Supreme Court has not squarely addressed the constitutional value and status of deceitful political speech. Now, why is that? Well, let's think about the Alvarez decision. Recall that the Defense of Valor Act required proof that a defendant communicated a false claim and did so with knowledge of its falsity. In other words, the statute required proof of both the statement's falsity and the speaker's deceptive intent. Because of this, in evaluating the statute's constitutionality, the court could have considered whether deceitful speech qualifies as a new category of unprotected speech, but it did not. Instead, Justice Kennedy's opinion considered whether the false statement of fact qualifies as a new category of speech that is valueless and unprotected for its own sake. On this issue, the government strenuously argued yes. Justice Kennedy's opinion decided no. Now, in addressing the constitutional value of Mr. Alvarez's assertions and whether his statements fall into some new category of unprotected speech, why did the government and the court focus primarily on the falsity of the speaker's message rather than primarily on the speaker's deceptive intent? And why does the distinction matter? Well, recall that when identifying counter speech as the preferred remedy for, harm, uh, for harmful speech, Kennedy specifically stated that the proper response to the straight out lie is the simple truth. In juxtaposing a lie with the truth in this way, Kennedy tangled two variables about the nature of speaking that are independent. First, whether a statement's intended meaning was true or false, and second, whether the speaker believed his intended meaning to be true or false. These variables obviously are independent because a person might make a statement that is true either while believing it true or believing it false, or a person might make a statement that is false, either while believing it true or believing it false. In Alvarez, this tangling of these independent concepts and the primary focus on the false statement of fact, rather than on the speaker's intent to deceive, is rooted in the constitutional law of defamation, and in particular, in three propositions about speech developed by the Supreme Court in a case called Gertz versus Robert Welch. 
These three Gertz propositions are important for analyzing the constitutional status of deceitful political speech. So I'm going to lay them out in some detail, and then I'll examine their merits. The first two Gertz propositions are as follows. First, there is no constitutional value in a false statement of fact, but there is constitutional value in a true statement of fact. Second, there is no such thing as a false idea. Now, the second proposition implies that every statement of an idea is constitutionally valuable and worthy of protection for its own sake. So, in other words, under the first two Gertz propositions, all statements of ideas and true statements of fact are constitutionally valuable and protected for their own sake. False statements of fact are not. Here's the third Gertz proposition. Some false statements of fact, despite being constitutionally valueless, should receive some constitutional protection, but only to provide strategic breathing space for speech that is valuable. And here's an example of uh, this strategic protection for some false statements of fact. A false statement of fact about a public official may be the basis for defamation liability only if the speaker acted with knowledge or recklessness that his statement was false. Now, what's this third proposition about? This third Gertz proposition reflects concerns that if people fear defamation liability based on making a statement that turns out to be false, they might be inhibited from making valuable true statements of fact or valuable statements of ideas. We should note that the first two Gertz propositions are normative. They identify speech that is valuable. They identify speech that is valueless. The third Gertz proposition is instrumental and strategic. It is concerned with how we can ensure that valuable speech remains effectively protected if we permit the regulation of speech that is valueless. Under this instrumental third Gertz proposition, requiring proof of a speaker's knowledge that his statement was false, or in other words, proof of his, of his deceptive intent, serves merely as a technical device to provide breathing space for speech that is valuable, true statements of fact, and statements of ideas. So these three Gertz propositions help explain why Minnesota and Ohio chose to structure their political false statement laws by focusing on false statements of fact. We also can understand why in Alvarez, the government largely overlooked the normative constitutional significance of a speaker's intent to deceive but instead try to establish explicitly that false statements of fact are a new category of speech that's constitutionally valueless and not protected for its own sake. These three Gertz propositions together have provided much of the doctrinal and conceptual framework since 1974 for the legislative enactment and judicial scrutiny of laws regulating deceptive political speech, and they still do. So on their merits, I'd like to explore the implications of these three Gertz propositions and to consider whether their lines differentiating valuable from value less speech are sound or whether perhaps they should be reconfigured. Indeed, I will suggest that the normative first Gertz proposition might attribute too little constitutional value and promise too little protection to the false statement of fact which the speaker honestly believed to be true. I'll also suggest that the normative second Gertz proposition might attribute too much constitutional value and promise too much protection to the statement of an idea which the speaker did not believe to be true. In fact, I'll suggest that the speaker's deceitful intent, which is made relevant by the instrumental third Gertz proposition only as a strategic device, perhaps instead should be understood as the normative heart of the matter for identifying value less speech that does not deserve protection for its own sake. To put this another way a little closer to home, I'll suggest a line, that a line more like that which our own Dean Chase drew in his dispute with those Harvard Law students could be more analytically sound. While we better differentiate the value of political speaking based on whether the speaker did or did not believe in the truth of his intended message, regardless of whether his message involved an idea or a fact, and regardless of whether if an assertion of fact, that assertion is deemed to have been true or false. Okay, time to dig a little bit deeper. 
Ultimately, determining whether speech is constitutionally valuable depends on why the freedom of speech is constitutionally protected. The dominant rationale has focused on the role speech plays for the operation of democracy. From this perspective, the court has established a cardinal prohibition, a regulatory purpose motivated by disapproval of the content of speech is constitutionally prohibited. Government may not enforce an orthodoxy by acting with the purpose of suppressing dissenting views because it disagrees with them. So in this light, consider the normative first skirts proposition. There is no constitutional value in a false statement of fact, but there is constitutional value in a true statement of fact. Well, what's involved in declaring that a statement of fact was false? Doing so requires a judgment of falsity by some government decision maker. Now, what if a government official or a jury did decide that a speaker's statement of fact was false? Should that decision really establish that the speaker's statement lacked constitutional value if the speaker believed her statement was true? To the contrary, I think, if the speaker believed her statement of fact was true, determining that it lacked constitutional value and could subject her to liability for resulting harms based on a government judgment of its falsity would involve a dynamic of orthodoxy suppressing dissent because of disagreement with the speaker's message. Someone who asserts that Barack Obama was born in Kenya and truly believes it, or who asserts that George W. Bush orchestrated the attacks of 9-11 and truly believes it, or who asserts that thousands of Muslims cheered the attacks of 9-11 and truly believes it. He might be quirky or crazy or just not that bright, but if he's honest about his beliefs when challenging orthodox judgments of fact, then why would he lack the same status in the community's freedom of speech as any other dissident would have when they challenge orthodox ideas or values? Judgments of fact, no less and no more than judgments about ideas or values, are essential factors for selecting representatives and for choosing policies. Disputes of fact when relevant to democratic decision making are political questions to be resolved electorally and legislatively, subject to generally deferential judicial oversight. If a political speaker believes his assertions of fact are true, his sincere statements cannot be viewed as having less than full constitutional value simply because orthodoxy disagrees. So in relation to democratic self-governance, the normative first skirts proposition attributes too little value, promises too little protection to speaker who orthodoxy deems to have been wrong about a matter of fact, but who communicated leaving their assertion to be true. And what about the normative second skirts proposition? There's no such thing as a false idea. Again, this implies that any communication of any idea about a public issue is constitutionally valuable and fully protected by the First Amendment. Asserting that lower taxes are good or that the Buffett rule is good or that carbon taxes are bad, these all involve the communication of ideas that cannot conclusively be true or false. And precisely because orthodoxy may not suppress dissent, the normative second Gertz proposition implies that no idea can be deemed more or less valuable than another in defining the right to speak, and that government may not pursue a purpose of deterring the expression of any idea simply because it disapproves. But even if there's no such thing as a false idea, there is such a thing as a deceitfully communicated idea. There is such a thing as a political speaker's communication of an idea, the intended meaning of which he did not believe to be true, but which he intended to persuade the public to accept as true. Should we really understand deceitful political speaking as being constitutionally valuable in service of democracy and as deserving protection for its own sake against a regulatory purpose of deterring its expression simply because it asserts an idea? The second verse proposition has obscured this question and the court has not chosen to address it. Having framed the issue, I'd now like to consider it further. Indeed, I'd like to address whether deceitful political speech, whether about an idea or a fact, advances democratic discourse and decision making such that it should be viewed as constitutionally valuable and protected for its own sake or not. Now, as is familiar to many in the Federalist 10, James Madison Council, that people pursue self-interest in politics, that they have license to do so, even when, as a faction, they act contrary to the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. Madison presented a view with limited aspirations 
about democratic competition and decision making. It was realistic, took people as they are, and relied on government structures to curb factional excess. From this low aspiration, high competition perspective, citizens naturally have a right to pursue self-interest not only through voting, but also through speaking, well, at least through speech that communicates their true views truthfully. But beyond this, does this factional concept of, of democracy imply that people engage in constitutionally valuable speech when they pursue self-interest by lying to each other about their true beliefs, whether about ideas or facts, and that legislatures are constitutionally prohibited from trying to deter such political lying? Does this factional model imply that it's democratically valuable for a presidential candidate to assert that marriage equality violates religious constraints on secular law if he actually believes otherwise, or that it's democratically valuable for a candidate to advocate monitoring Muslim neighborhoods if he actually believes that such policy would be wrong and illegal and has no intention to follow through, or that it's democratically valuable for an oil company to assert that burning fossil fuels does not cause climate change if management actually believes that it does. I'm inclined to conclude, even from the perspective of low aspiration factional democracy, that statements like these, if deceitfully made, do not add value to political discourse. Sure, a deceitful assertion can trigger thoughts and debate, but that's not sufficient for viewing it as a valuable part of the freedom of speech. An earthquake can trigger thoughts and debate. And although intentionally deceptive speech has the form of speech, it's a version of speech that cannot lead to a true and meaningful engagement between the speaker's actual thoughts and the thoughts of his deceived listeners. Indeed, in service of factional democracy, the First Amendment is concerned not only with speakers, but also with listeners, and then with responsive speakers, and thereafter with voters. Truthful political expression obviously does add value to factional democracy by enabling people to pursue self-interest in each of these roles, whether as speakers, or as listeners, or as responsive speakers, or as voters. But deceitful, uh, a speaker's deceitful intent renders his message a false predicate for the deceived listener's responsive thoughts. Similarly, deceitful speech does not enable a responsive speaker to craft an argument toward addressing, much less changing, the deceiver's true mind. And without that, what's the point of political discourse? A speaker's deceitful intent renders his message a false predicate for voters' choices. Deceitful speech cannot lead to a meeting of the minds even about defining a disagreement, let alone about resolving it. Because the deceiver was not speaking his true mind, his opponents must try to compromise with a fiction. Thus, deceitful political speech, whether about ideas or facts, does not add value for listeners or responsive speakers or voters. It adds value only for the deceitful speaker himself and beyond his fair share. For factional democracy, while public decision making need not be public spirited, at least it must be rational. A presumption that the political process actually yields rational decisions is the basis for judicial restraint under equal protection rationality review. But deceitful political speech undermines justification for presuming that rationality. Public opinion and representative decisions are constrained from rationally responding to the realities of the political community when based on the fictions created by deceitful political speech, whether about ideas or facts. And as a distressing possible example, consider again our decades of inaction on climate change perhaps resulting in part from a domineering communication of deceitful messages by oil company managers, other interest groups, and the politicians they funded. For these reasons, I'm inclined to conclude that even for a low aspiration, high competition, factional concept of democracy in which one otherwise might think that anything goes, the normative second Gertz proposition attributes too much value and promises too much protection to the statement of an idea which the speaker did not believe to be true. Instead, I'm inclined to conclude that deceitful political speech, whether about ideas or facts, does not add value to democratic discourse, should be deemed a category of speech that does not deserve protection for its own sake, 
and therefore the leg a legislative purpose to deter its communication could be consistent with the freedom of speech and not impermissible per se. But let me immediately emphasize a critical instrumental qualification. And this qualification would be analogous to the instrumental third thirds proposition. Because the truthful communication of a speaker's true views is the essence of constitutionally valuable speech, some deceitful speech, and probably a great deal of it, despite being constitutionally valueless, must be accorded strategic protection to provide breathing space for people freely to communicate their true views. Well, interestingly, the Supreme Court at one time came close to some of this. In 1964, 10 years before Gertz, the court issued an opinion in Garrison versus Louisiana, which was an early case developing the constitutional law of defamation. In Garrison, in dicta, the court said the following. Although honest utterance, even if inaccurate, may further free speech, it does not follow that the lie should enjoy a like immunity. The use of the known lie as a tool is at odds with the premises of democratic government. Calculated falsehood falls into that class of utterances which are no essential part of any exposition of ideas. Ten years later, in the normative first skirts proposition, the court moved away from Garrison's view about the value of honest utterances involving false statements of fact. Furthermore, 10 years later, in the normative second Gertz proposition, the court overlooked Garrison's view about calculated falsehoods and its implications for determining the value of deceitfully expressing an idea which the speaker did not believe to be true. What I'm suggesting essentially involves returning to Garrison's suggestion that false statements of fact which the speaker believed to be true are constitutionally valuable and deserve protection for their own sake. And I'm talking about pushing Garrison's view about calculated falsehoods toward its logical conclusion that statements of ideas deceitfully made are constitutionally value less and do not deserve protection for their own sake. Well, I hope I've raised as at least a conceivable possibility that the best remedy for deceitful political speech might not always be counter speech after all. And if this is at least conceivable, that our imaginations can be liberated to explore different methods, different ways to deter deceitfulness in political speech while leaving sufficient breathing space for speakers to feel fully free to express their true views truthfully. Of course, this is much easier said than done. We have to guard against the risk of politically motivated enforcement by government officials. We'd have to guard against the risk of sham enforcement actions by political opponents, because these possibilities could chill sincere political speech. We'd have to devise principles for determining what a speaker's intent was. And these principles would have to provide sufficient breathing space for people freely to communicate their true views truthfully. But here's just one avenue to explore. Toward providing this breathing space, while addressing the problems of deceitful political speech, legislatures and courts might, might focus on circumstances where otherwise deceitful speakers are least likely to be chilled toward silence. For example, we might focus on those who are communicating the greatest quantity of political speech, who generally would be wealthy corporations, PACs, and candidates for office. By the very amount of money and effort they expend to communicate, these speakers demonstrate an incentive to pursue their interests through speech unlikely to be extinguished. Their political speaking seems especially hardy and robust. And like those engaged in commercial speech, they seem unlikely to de de be dissuaded from speaking, even if they are deterred from lying. Furthermore, these highly motivated and highly resourced political actors can shape or even dominate public discourse by the amount of their speaking. They therefore pose the greatest threat of causing the harms associated with deceitful political speech. So this is a context where the risk of shilling speakers towards silence might be lowest and where the harms from undeterred deceitfulness might be greatest. In this context of high volume, highly resourced, highly motivated political speakers. We see an intersection between concerns about the potential domination of discourse by wealth and power 
and concerns about the harms caused by deceitful political speech. This intersection of concerns, highly troubling as it is, was not addressed either by Citizens United or by the provisions of the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, which that case invalidated. By focusing on this context of high volume, high volume highly resourced political speech, there may be some significant space for exploring ways through law to reduce the most serious harms caused by deceitful political speech while leaving ample breathing space for sincere expression and thereby to enhance our national discourse. But in the end, it simply might not be possible to devise methods that can effectively serve these companion objectives of deterring political deceitfulness while leaving truthfulness uninhibited. But we'll never know unless we seriously grapple with the possibilities. And we are unlikely to begin that project without a newly clarified normative understanding that maybe, just maybe, deceitful political speaking, whether about ideas or facts, is constitutionally valued less and does not deserve protection for its own sake. Well, OK. You know what? Maybe I'm wrong about all of this. <laughs> but if so, I'm sincerely wrong. <laughs> and in the weeks ahead, I look forward to hearing why. And what I believe is right today, I could well decide is wrong tomorrow, or maybe the next day. But wrong or not, ultimately, the prevalence of deceitful speaking in our national discourse and the seeming unlikelihood of sound regulatory interventions in the short term, if ever, lead me to appreciate even more how very important are those lovers of truth and fairness and honest secrets after facts about whom Dean Chase was writing when he chastised those Harvard Law students. Indeed, it all leads me to appreciate how very important are people like my colleagues here at New York Law School, like those at other law schools, and in the broader academic community as a whole. It may be that it's only through the self-restraint and self-regulation so characteristic of our academic communities that we still can find a predominance of people who speak their minds truthfully, not manipulative, when debating disputed issues. And it may be within our nation today that an academic community, through its teaching and its scholarship, is one of the few places where sincerity in the pursuit of truth and in the truthful communication of a speaker's true views supersede a goal of winning the interest battle of the moment. Where else but in our academic communities does the prevailing discourse bear any meaningful resemblance to political discourse that most deserves protection as part of our nation's freedom of speech, discourse among those who are honestly seeking after facts, honestly pursuing self-interest, and honestly expressing their views. Thank you so much for listening.